Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would be our focus, that you would be the one who leads us, who teaches us, and who saves us, and that our legacy might be found in you and in you alone. In your name we pray. Amen. So this last year I had a big birthday, like one of those where you turn decades, like I turned the big four zero. And some of you are like, 40, man, that is so old. And some of you are like, 40, oh man, man, I would love to be 40 again, like 40 is so young. And to be honest with you, there are days where I could go in either direction. Like some days I'm like, I'm good, I feel good, I'm young. And then some days I look in the mirror and I think, ooh, eh, yeah, I'm getting a little bit older. And one of those days that I regularly begin to sense my age is when I go to get my hair cut. You know, they put you in the chair and they drape this cape around you. And, and it used to be when I got my hair cut that my hair color matched the color of the cape. It was black. And now I go and they, they pull out the snippers and zoom, 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 and I'm looking at the hair that is falling on the cape. It's not black anymore. Uh-uh. There's a lot of gray in there. And then I go home and it gets even worse because my wife or my kids will inevitably make some comment about, oh, you are really going gray. I'm like, how gray am I? And I go into the bathroom and I start looking. Yeah. I'm starting. I'm starting to get old. And here's the thing. Statistically, do you know how long the average U.S. male lives? 79 years. Which means I just celebrated a milestone. I am now halfway to the grave. Some of you are like, I'm a little bit further along than that. I'm three quarters of the way to the grave. Some of you are like, um, I think I've outlived my life expectancy here. But this is what inevitably happens to all of us. We eventually reach that moment in our lives where we realize this. One day, we will all leave. One day, we're all going to die. I think about the words of the ancient singer-songwriter King David in Psalm 39. He says this, Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. Some of you are like, a handbreadth? What kind of unit of measurement is that? Put up your hand. You've got four fingers. That's a hand breadth. This is the smallest unit of ancient measurement. And David says, that's what your life is. That's what my life is. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Maybe not the most upbeat words for a song, right? Like, can you imagine the words of Psalm 39 poking through into the top 40? Hmm. Probably not. And yet, there's biblical wisdom here that is echoed elsewhere throughout Scripture. Because one day, we will all leave. Sooner or later, all of us will die. You know, the words that King David writes remind me of the words of another singer-songwriter, more modern, one that maybe many of you are familiar with. Tim McGraw. In 2004, Tim McGraw wrote a song that topped the charts for 10 weeks straight that was named the number one song of the year by Billboard magazine. The song was, Live Like You Are Dying. But do you know the story behind the song? So Tim McGraw was actually not born with the name Tim McGraw. He was given the name Samuel 
Timothy Smith. But when he was 10 years old, he was rummaging around through his mom's closet looking for Christmas presents, and he came across his birth certificate, which did not have the last name Smith. It had the last name McGraw. And so Tim talks to his mom and says, can you explain this to me? I thought my last name was Smith, and my birth certificate says my last name is McGraw. And so she sits him down and she tells him, when I was 18 years old, I lived in Florida, I fell for a minor league baseball player named Tug McGraw. Some of you are like, Tug McGraw, didn't he go on to play in the majors? Yeah, he did. He played for the Philadelphia Phillies, he played for the New York Mets. She said, I fell for Tug McGraw. And I got pregnant, and he got called up before I could tell him that I was pregnant, and I just let him pursue his dream and his career. And I moved to Louisiana, and I moved in with my relatives. And seven months after you were born, I married another man whose last name was Smith, who has raised you as his own. And at this moment, Tim's mind is just spinning, because not only is Tug McGraw his dad, but Tug McGraw was his favorite baseball player. Tug McGraw was a man whose poster was plastered on the wall of his bedroom and whose cards he had collected. And now he's trying to collect his thoughts and make sense of of this information that he's receiving. And he wants to know his dad. So he reaches out, and Tug McGraw denies it, says, no, I... I don't have a son. You're not my son. And this goes on for a number of years until finally, when Tim is 18 years old, he convinces his dad to meet up with him just once. And when Tug looks into the face of 18-year-old Tim, he sees himself. And he realizes, this is my son. And there's a change of heart. And they form this strong father-son bond for the next number of years. But then when Tug is in his early 60s, in 2003, he's diagnosed with brain cancer, a very aggressive form, and he's given three weeks to live. So what does he do with that time? How does he live like he's dying? He spends that time down on Tim's Tennessee farm. And three weeks actually turns into nine months, nine beautiful months that they share together. And when his dad passes away in 2004, Tim writes this song as a tribute to his father. And I want you to listen to a portion of that this morning. You know, think about that song and the message behind it. Live like you were dying. Live like you have limited time. Because the truth is, whether you have a cancer diagnosis or not, you all have limited time. One day, we all leave. But the question that Tim poses is, what will I do with it? What will I do with the one life that God has given me to live? That's why we're doing this series. We're talking about legacy. And the tagline to the series is living with leaving in mind. Because this is what a legacy is. A legacy is what we leave behind. A legacy is what lasts when we're no longer here. Now, a lot of people, when they think about a legacy, they think in terms of a financial legacy. This is what we bequeath to our benefactors. These are the assets that we leave behind. And certainly, when it comes to a legacy, there is a financial piece to that. But here's what you need to know. Your legacy cannot merely be a financial legacy. And some of you, you've been working hard to ensure that your kids are set up for success, that your grandkids are set up for success. But your legacy cannot merely be a financial legacy. It has to be a faith legacy. 
So let's listen to the words from King David. If we keep reading in Psalm 39, he says this in verses 6 and 7. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. He talks about both, doesn't he? He talks about finances, and he talks about faith. But what does he say about finances? He says, eventually your finances will be frittered away. Whether in your generation, the next generation, or the generation yet to come. Wealth does not last. There's only one thing that endures. And that's the faith that we leave to the next generation. So if we pull this together, here's what could be said. If you leave your children full pockets but empty souls, you have neglected your most important duty. So my question for you is this. What are you doing right now with the one life that God has given you to live, not only to leave your children set up for success financially, but what are you doing to leave a soul that is full. Let me go back for a moment to King David, and we're going to talk about him more throughout this series. So King David is arguably the wealthiest man in the ancient world. He's a Warren Buffett. He's a billionaire. He is loaded. He is set. But he gets to the end of his life, and this is in 1 Kings chapter 2, and he brings his son Solomon in. And the last words that he imparts to him are these words. I'm about to go the way of all the earth. See, one day we all leave. David knows that. So he said to his son, So be strong. Show yourself a man. And observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in his ways. And keep his decrees and commands. His laws and requirements. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say anything about his finances. He doesn't say, son, I want you to know your daddy is loaded. And that means you are set up for success. Whatever you need, I've got you covered. He doesn't talk about that at all. He solely focuses on matters of faith. He says, son, I want you to seek after the Lord. I want you to pursue him with your whole heart, just as I have. I want you to live in obedience to him. So here's what I would take away from this exchange between David and his son Solomon. When it comes to leaving a legacy, here's what we do. We do one thing. We go after the Lord so that those who come after us will go after him as well. This is the legacy that David leaves to his son Solomon. And this is the legacy that God intends for us to leave to the next generation and the next generation. To love God. To love those that he loves. To seek after him. To live in obedience to his word. We go after the Lord so that those who go after us will go after him as well. So earlier in the message, I referred to Tim McGraw's song, Live Like You Were Dying. A couple of years before that, in 2002, there was another recording artist, this one not as widely known. Her name is Nicole Nordeman. She's a Christian recording artist. And she also wrestled with that question of legacy. What will I leave behind? How do I live my life now knowing that I'm leaving? And she recorded a song simply called Legacy. I want you to listen to a portion of it this morning. You catch the words of the chorus. She says this, I want to leave a legacy. How will they remember me? Did I choose to love? Did I point to you enough to make a mark on things? I want to leave an offering A child of mercy and grace who blessed your name unapologetically and leave that kind of legacy. 
I want you to chew on those words for a moment this morning. Because when it comes to leaving a legacy, there's only two options. Either we can live our lives seeking to leave a name for ourselves, or we can live our lives seeking to make a name for Jesus. And there's a lot of people in this world right now who are seeking to make a name for themselves. How will people remember me? I mean, just look in the business world. There are so many companies, so many corporations that are established upon the legacy of the name of an individual. Gucci. It's a last name. Versace. It's a last name. Wells Fargo. It's two last names. Porsche. It's a last name. Ford, it's a last name. Chrysler, it's a last name. Marriott, it's a last name. It's all of these companies that are established upon the last name of individuals. But I want to let you know something. Every single one of those companies will eventually go belly up. Every single one of those last names will eventually be forgotten. And so will your name. And so will my name. We're a mere hand breath. There's only one name. Only one name that we desire to be on our lips and on the lips of our children. Only one name that will endure into eternity. And that's the name of Jesus. So may we bless his name unapologetically. You know, I don't know how much time you have left. Maybe you're halfway there like me. Maybe you're a little bit less. Maybe you're a little bit more. Maybe you've outlived your life expectancy. But when it comes to considering your legacy this weekend, may you go after the Lord so that those who go after you may go after him as well. And may you continue to make much of his name. Amen.